from the standpoint, and, and uh, you mentioned ARC, most of the argument at this point for ARC, although it's evolving, is the fact that there are higher rates of MRD negativity. We now have a national trial going on that basically says you can give patients any, uh, any induction therapy that you want, assess their MRD status, the MRD positive patients are going on to transplant, the MRD negative patients are being randomized between rituximab maintenance and auto transplant. So that's gonna really see, can MRD guide um, what, what we can do uh, and do we need to continue with an auto transplant if you're MRD negative, which is what's been in, in myeloma. Is anyone, are you using MRD at this point uh, in uh, so your patients not, and what's your sense? Not, uh, not outside the setting of a trial at this uh -huh. point. Okay, and then how do you, uh, Alexei, how do you follow these patients? I'm, I'm kind of uh, a minimalist from the standpoint of uh, if patients are, are uh, doing well and in remission, we've moved away from scans in a lot of situations in large cell lymphoma. Um, once people, once you have a negative PET scan at end of treatment, I think there, there, there's an argument, there was an abstract presented here suggesting that uh, in follicular lymphoma uh, that um, the value of PET, most relapses occur only in surveillance scans in follicular lymphoma, only about 4% uh, of scans had anything meaningful. What about mantle cell? Do you do lots of scans in these patients? Or uh, no, I, I do not. I, I think it would be difficult to run such a trial in mantle uh -huh. cell lymphoma. Mm -hmm. So I uh, essentially um, apply the data in, in uh, more aggressive lymphomas uh, to mm -hmm. mantle cell and uh -huh. I limit scans. Okay. And John, your thoughts on scanning? How do you scan these patients? We overdo scans. Uh -huh. uh, I'm a fan of fewer scans. Patients are a fan of fewer scans and I think uh, we should do exactly as Alexi's saying, follow the large cell and the more aggressive approach. Mm -hmm. so, so from the standpoint, I mean, we've talked about auto transplant. I think, uh, Andre, you referenced the Gerson study presented here, looking at uh, auto transplant um, as a target. Are you, what do you tell a patient, um, uh, John, from the standpoint of you're gonna do an auto transplant, do you expect that patient's gonna live longer with an auto transplant? Do you think it's just gonna be in remission longer? How do you, you know, in the absence of really good modern randomized trial data, this retrospective data, what, what's your conversation with a patient about? Yeah, you know, I think the, the, the goal of the transplant is to provide the longest remission we can get for pa mm -hmm. patients. And the best chance to do that is in that very first remission. Andre alluded to that, of course, as well. And transplant's an option for the patients. Now, it is true, uh, even though I've extolled the virtues of transplant, that it's very controversial. And this abstract that you alluded to, I think, uh, paints that picture. It was an abstract in, in about a thousand patients or so, and looked at uh, the, uh, a series of patients in a retrospective fashion who got a transplant or didn't get a transplant. And of course, the ones who got a transplant did better. Why did they do better? Well, they did better because they were the more fit patients, they were the younger patients, they're the ones who could get more intensive therapy. And in fact, if you look at the patients who didn't get a transplant, about 70% of them didn't get a transplant because either the doctor or the patient didn't think it was appropriate. So it tells you that the patient population is very, very different. But that being said, you know, uh, if you're really looking in a younger patient to get the best outcome you can. You've got one chance at that auto transplant perhaps, maybe, and that's the time. And I think it's a very important conversation to have about patients, uh, with patients about the pluses and minuses. I think transplant is uh, important to remember that this is um, usually with fairly low morbidity now of how we do this. Most autologous transplants that we do are as, done as outpatients the risk of having a life-threatening complication is less than 1%. Not to say that people don't get sick, but people do well and can get through that, and especially a younger, more fit patient. Steve, are you doing? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I just want to mention that there was another study that was published in um, Dr. Lacasse um, from the SEER database, looking at the um, hypersivan versus ARCHA versus hardest therapy consolidation. And uh, obviously the PFS was three times better uh, in intensive or hardest therapy approach comparing to ARCHA. 
But if you pull the high dose therapy or intensive therapy together, there was clear survival advantage. So I think this is, uh, to the point that you alluded to, John, is that at a time where we didn't really use maintenance, this was something that clearly gave us a longer duration. The maintenance, particularly now we have MRD, is going to be really the question. And then the European group is looking at different ways to look at that by incorporating Ibrutinib and then looking at Ibrutinib consolidation slash maintenance versus a high dose therapy and transplant plus a trial that you referred to. So I think that we have to really put in perspective that we have now a different approaches that might maybe um, change a little bit the way we think right. about this.